Hello, welcome to Treehouse Knits, episode 15. I'm so glad you're here. My name is Rachel, and this is a podcast about all things creative and crafty within the fiber arts, mostly. Today, I have quite a few things I want to share with you. Of course, we will trickle tips and tricks throughout the episode as well. So I've got some finished objects I want to share with you, works in progress, and I think we'll start out with our subscriber giveaway. So just to let you know, I am on all the social medias as Treehouse Knits, and you can also find my website where everything kind of comes together in one place as thknits.com. There you'll find links to other podcast episodes, you'll find links to the um, textile history reading club that myself and Meadow from uh, The Woven Road are holding and you'll just find also some other information about me. So that's a great first place to go if you're looking for me anywhere on the social medias, thknits.com. You can also find me as Treehouse Knits on Ravelry and I do keep my projects as up to date as possible. Um, I enjoy using Ravelry for that purpose, so you will find a lot of information. If you have any questions about anything I show you today that I didn't answer during this episode, chances are you'll find the answers there on Ravelry. So, uh, also on Ravelry, we do have a podcast page, Ravelry group page, and uh, again, it's Treehouse Knits podcast on Ravelry in the group section. On there, you will find links to all of my episodes, but you'll also find a um, thread on there, ask me anything, feel free to ask any questions, and if I can answer it quickly on uh, Facebook, I, or on um, Ravelry, I will, uh, but if I think a lot of people might like the answer to that question, I might include it on a future podcast too. You know, one other thing I do have on the Ravelry group is a where are you from thread, which I am, I'm fascinated how YouTube brings us all together throughout across the world and it's just so fun for me to see where everybody's coming from so it's also kind of an introduction thread too so if you want let us know where you're coming from where you're watching the podcast from and a little bit about yourself too have you guys been following the wing and a prayer Instagram stories like I mentioned last time oh my gosh has a lot happened since the last time we talked we got to watch chicks being hatched from eggs um, we got to see their cute three little sheepdogs, their puppies, and they were just growing up together. And then just recently, two of the little puppies got sent to Kentucky. So we saw that goodbye. Um, and then just in the last couple of days, Paisley the sheep, the Shetland sheep, finally had her babies. She had triplets. And according to Tammy, that was the first time they'd ever had triplets on the farm. So it was very excited and fascinating. You got to see the actual lambs being born and just how instinct takes over the sheep and how Paisley cleaned off her babies when they were born. And just, it was a beautiful thing to watch and just really interesting to learn about. And when you see all these things happening on a farm, you kind of, I mean, Tammy does such a great job of showing us just the everyday life of a farm. And I mean, there's animals coming, there's animals going, um, the love that she shows for her animals and the care, as well as all of the people that come to the farm that get to learn these things from Tammy as well. So any farms out there who open up their doors to other people, I think that's just a great idea to help the rest of the world un help understand where their food, where their fiber comes from. And uh, I just appreciate all the work Tammy does. I'm sure she does not have a lot of extra time in her busy day to be on social media, but I just want to say I so appreciate it seeing all those wonderful things. So check out Wing and a Prayer on at, in Wing and a Prayer Farm on Insta Stories. You will not regret it. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about the giveaway. I went into podcasting to meet people, other pe like-minded folk like me who love the fiber arts um, and who I could kind of learn from and we could learn together. I was finding that my poor friends and family would kind of look at me, oh, okay, that's exciting, Rachel, we're glad that you're enjoying this, but to find people who are as excited about this as I am was the reason that I started to 
do this YouTube channel. Um, and now that I'm over a thousand subscribers, I think I'm pushing 1100. I definitely wanted to say thank you to all of you who've introduced yourselves and created a dialogue with me. Uh, about and around the fiber arts. So I thought I'd pull together a few items for the giveaway. I showed you this last time. We're going to be giving away this making um, magazine. It's published by Matter in the beautiful state of Maine. This is their fauna, uh, fauna issue and we're going to throw that into the giveaway. So I started out with this and I thought well let's make it kind of a a main theme and when I thought of Maine I thought of my peace fleece so what I would love to do is give away a kit to make these mittens these are the sugar maple Baltic mittens and the kit comes with all three colors for the mitts as well as the instructions for the mitts and I'll stick in here an interesting story about how Peace Fleece got uh, started. This will tell you all about Peace Fleece and the history of Peace Fleece, but I'll read to you just the last paragraph describing a little bit about who Peace Fleece is. Um, and this is written by one of the um, founders of Peace Fleece. Peace Fleece for me has been a a way to move beyond the pain of the 60s, Vietnam, and the Cold War. Our office is a sheep farm in Maine, a crowded family apartment in Moscow, or the back of a pickup truck somewhere between Tel Aviv and Jericho. After we return from every trip, meaning um, to get sheep uh, wool for their product, we appreciate the courage of our partners, many who are in the midst of a political, social, or economic crisis, and some are living in a war zone. And we appreciate our own co-workers, neighbors, and friends who make this part of America a wonderful place to raise a family and run a business. By working with people who sell wool or tend to livestock every day, we hope to find a common ground that can slowly lead to mutual understanding and interdependence no matter how deep the hurt or how old the conflict. We invite you to visit us here in Maine on the internet or through the pages of our catalog. So that's Peace Fleece, the company, a little bit about it, but I I think it'd be great if you just check them out online too because they have a lot to, to offer and a great backstory. These are the colors for the mitt, the mitts, and that will be part of our giveaway as well. So this kit to make the mittens, the making magazine, and I will throw in some other fun items as well. So how do you enter the giveaway? I would like you to go on to our Ravelry podcast page and I will have a thread on there put up. I will um, have some sort of prompt for you to answer the regular standard way of doing these um, giveaways and just answer the question and the next podcast I will have drawn a winner. So thank you so much for watching the show and for joining in on the giveaway. I hope you enjoy it. So in thinking a little bit more, you know, I just read to you a little bit about Peace Fleece and who they are and how um, they say that they go around the world to collect their wool and it, it connects people from different walk, uh, different backgrounds and walks of life and ethnicities and socioeconomic statuses. And um, that made me think of another Insta stories that I thoroughly enjoyed watching the last week. If you watch Knit, if you are a follower, I should say, of Knit Collage on Instagram, um, she is the maker who makes all that really funky, thick and thin, colorful, vibrant yarns. The real specialty yarns. Check out Knit Collage. She, I believe, um, spent a good chunk of time in India and in maybe other parts of the world, and that's really inspired her um, colors and the fibers that she pulls together and just kind of her aesthetic for yarn design. Well, she went to India to the factory where her yarn is made, and the Insta stories were so cool. Not only did we get kind of the cultural bit of India, um, the different foods, the really colorfully painted buildings and um, trucks, we also saw the crazy, and it's crazy to us because it's a cultural thing, I know, but um, 
you know, parents riding on mopeds with babies and no helmets and not a lot of rules around driving, which could make someone from where I am from very nervous, but interesting nonetheless. But we also got to meet the ladies who work in the um, in the factory that makes the yarn, and it's so hands-on, so um, specialized. These ladies are getting the fleece, they're spinning the fleece, they're prepping the fiber, they're spinning the fleece, they're putting colors together, the way they spin the thick and thin, um, putting in other pieces into the yarns, packaging the yarns. We got to meet all these really beautiful Indian ladies who you could tell they share the same passion and joy. They get the same gratitude that we get um, playing with our fiber that they did. And you got to see them all get on their little bus and get driven away every day. And just, they were a joyous bunch. It was so really cool to watch. So I know you can't really see Insta stories over and over. They disappear, but I think it would be great if, um, I can't think of her name from Knit Collage, if she could put together a little something because that that's more permanent, maybe on YouTube. I found a really neat um, tool that I bet many of you already are familiar with, but I was at Hobby Lobby the other day and came across uh, a product by Yarn Valet called the Comfort Grip for crochet. And it's these little, you can see I got it on sale as well. Uh, it's just these little um, cushiony tubes that fit on your crochet hooks. And I have inherited every size of crochet hook and I'm not a serious crocheter, but I do do crochet projects every once in a while. And I inherited a bunch of different sizes I probably have every size you could possibly need, but they're the old kind of not really ergonomically friendly. Um, well, this is a really tiny hook. You can see it's even got a cover to it, um, but they're not ergonomically comfortable. And I see all the new crochet hooks and kind of think, oh, I would really like to try with the comfort grips. Well, I can put these from Crochet Valet right on my inherited ones, and they do. It makes it feel much better, uh, easier on the hands, and the grip is just a lot easier to hold, whereas I'm slipping and sliding on the metal. So if you are like me and have a bunch of metal crochet hooks, you might want to look into getting some of these comfort grips from Yarn Valet. Okay, so the next thing I want to tell you about is a hat that I finished since the last time we talked, and that's my Busta Beanie. I used, you can find information on Ravelry about the yarns I used, but um, it's a combination of Madeline Tosh and Leading Men Fiber Arts is the lighter gray color. And I put a pom-pom on the top. This is a faux fur pom-pom that I actually got in a non-conventional way. Um, you don't always have to go online or to a local yarn store if you wanna get one of these furry pom-poms and spend, you know, 10 bucks to get the furry pom-pom. I happened to be at the Nordstrom Rack a few weeks ago and in their sale bin, they had a lot of accessories for purses and those clip-on pom-poms were in their clearance bin. And they also included really cool leatherish tassels and this other um, clip component. I got this whole piece for a couple of bucks on sale. So what I did is, this is what the black one looked like originally, I took off the pom-pom and I used it for my Busta beanie hat. And I also have these cool tassels that I can use as, I think, zipper pulls on some of the bags that I make. So I just wanted to share with you that a little unconventional way to find some pom-poms is through companies, um, you know, like Nordstrom Rack, I bet you could go to any kind of discount uh, chain that has handbags and see if they've got any of these there. The um, Busta beanie hat is definitely a beanie. I actually added a few stitches. You can 
read about that on my cast on edge so it's a little bit bigger I have a bigger head and a lot of hair so I knew I needed a little bigger and I do like the size that it turned out I was watching watching Emily from Fiber Town and she did a Busta beanie hat in a sport DK weight and I really like how it turned out so I, I may go ahead and do that um, try that version as well because I do have a lot of sport weight yarn that I could use it's a very it is a very fast knit I can hear my parents laughing at me right now because they yeah fast for you is what they would say but what's really cool about it is there are no floats that you have to catch because it changes color enough so this would be a really I mean it'd be an intense first project because there are no um, relaxing rows of all solid color it just go it's constant color work um, so I might not recommend it for a brand new color work knitter, but why not? If you really want this hat, you will make it happen. If you, if you want it bad enough, you will definitely make it happen, but it's nice because you don't have to catch any floats. So I say go for it. And I love that little color, that pop of color at the bottom cast on. So that is my Busta beanie hat. Shetland Wool Week by Goodrin Johnson. You know the drill. You've seen them all over. Okay, the other... Yeah. Um, item that I finally finished completely meaning I got the buttons on I don't remember how much I showed you last time but it's the Gramps card again I love how this turned out I love the little elbow pads and I picked out buttons that are just kind of really traditional grandpa kind of buttons and I had some yarn left so of course I had to make a little hat to match so buttons and putting buttons on sweaters. I know a lot of times the finishing is the hardest part for us knitters. And I've seen people put buttons on in all different ways. If you if you would like to watch a good video on how to put buttons on your knitwear, I highly recommend going to Very Pink Knits. She's got a great video on how I put my buttons on sweaters, something like that. Check that out. The way that I usually do it is I take a... Um, some regular thread and I thread my needle I take the button and I just go around a couple times in the buttonhole then I bring it bring both ends through my knitted piece and then I just tie a surgeon's knot so it's like a square knot but you wrap it three times and then you do it again three times pull and that's and then I just clip the edges and I've had never I've never really had any problems um, with buttons falling out that way so you know don't think you have to lay your button on it like you do with a fabric piece and go in and out I just wrap my yarn through the holes of the button first and and then sometimes what I'll even do is then tie a square knot on the back of that and then I bring the two pieces through where I want the button and then I tie it really strong on the back and then trim off the edges that's how I do it some people use um, use actual yarn when they do their buttons but I'm finding the buttons that I usually put on things the holes aren't big enough for my yarn so that is my Gramps cardigan and that's a tin can knits project you can find lots of information online um, in my project page for that particular project let's talk a little bit about a couple of projects that I'm working on right now the first project that I have been working on slowly is my rusty cardigan. And this is a cardigan that I am knitting with this Plutolope yarn from Iceland. It's been a really interesting knit. You have to be very careful with the yarn because it breaks. It's unspun uh, Letlope basically. So it's before it turns into the yarn that we're all familiar with. It's this yarn, and I talk a lot about this um, particular yarn on my last podcast. So, or maybe it's been two podcasts ago, but check that out if you want to hear a little bit more about my experience with the yarn. I'm finding that I cannot take this project with me anywhere. I need to keep that plate of Plutolope on my desk here in my office and then just knit. <laughs> so, I'm still working on the body of my sweater. And this will eventually get steaked into a cardigan, but I love the fabric that it's creating. So um, it's worth the slow time that it's taking. I, I'm realizing that I do a lot of knitting on the go in the car and oh, downstairs, that kind of thing. So 
this one is taking a little longer and I'm seeing a lot of people done with their sweaters already so ah, I just want to go faster on it but I've got places to go and things to do so I can't work on it as much as I'd like to. Um, so once the body's done I'll work on the sleeves and then I'll connect the sleeves to the body and then the color work begins. So I think I've decided that at this point I enjoy doing sweaters top down uh, especially sweaters that have yoke and color work because you can really get into the project and then see the beautiful color work and then that inspires me to finish kind of the boring stockinette uh, round and round because I want to wear it um, whereas now it's like I'm just kind of knitting the boring stuff and I just want to get to that color work so nothing is ins I mean that's inspiring me to get to the color work but not as much as the color work inspires me when I can see it to get the project done so that's kind of where we are on this yarn now I'm at this point with the knitting I'm not sure I would ever use this yarn again um, it's been a great experience and I'm happy that I'm doing it but you know I like to be able to take my projects places and knit so I'm not sure I would knit with that yarn again let me tell you a little bit about this mystery knit along that I've been doing. It is, I've talked about it in another podcast, it's called the Secret Skein Mystery Make Along. And the pattern that we're using is a, a pattern designed by Jillian Harkness. The yarn I'm using is a yarn by Ellie and Ada. I have her tag here. First time I've ever used this particular dyer's yarn. And the story that goes along with this mystery knit along has been created by the Cottage Notebook Podcast. And it has been so much fun. Every week we get the clue, which is the next section of our shawl pattern that we're making, as well as a link to a download for um, a mystery that we're listening along. Such a cool concept, I've mentioned it before, and the pattern is really turning out beautifully. If, you, if you're working on this and don't wanna see it, look away. I am done with clue two, we received clue three on Friday, and so far it's a really lacy number. I cannot wait to block it out, but it's this really pretty flower uh, motif lace pattern. And then we got to this section and you can't, let's see, let me put it the right side up. When I block it out, it will look like hearts. I guess you can see it there. So that's where we're at right now. I have a feeling that this yarn is going to block out so beautifully. It is a combination of merino and silk and nylon, I believe. And um, it's been a really pretty easy pattern to follow, lots of repetition, which makes it nice when you want to listen and pay attention to the story because there are a lot of characters and you definitely need to pay attention. But that is where I'm at with the mystery skein, the secret skein mystery make along. And um, kudos to that team of three for putting this together. That's a lot of work. One thing I want to state again, and I think I've mentioned it before, is the importance of the tools that you're using. Like any hobby or any thing that you're creating in this world, if you have the right tools, it makes the job so much easier. I think I heard, I was listening to a podcast the other day, it might have been the um, Knit More Girls, and they were talking about how if you wanted to saw through a log, you wouldn't use a butter knife. And uh, if you, they had a whole bunch of analogies, but it made sense to me. And when I'm working with silk and lace and merino, it's a slipperier fabric. So I like to use a wood needle, a wood that's kind of, that's got a little bit of slip to it. So for this particular project, I'm using, I think these are Knitter's Pride Cubic wooden needles. Um, I love the join is doing really well for me in this project and when you're doing lace work join is really can kind of make or break how much you love working on the project and this particular wood finish is working really well for me on this project the one thing that is not working well for me 
but I'm dealing with it is the color of the needle. It's dark and so is my yarn. And not that I can't, I can see it okay, but I think if I had a lighter needle, I'd love to try those Lukey, I think that's how you pronounce it, those Birchwood light colored needles for this project. Um, but I think if I had a lighter color, it would be easier on my eyes. So there's just so many components to knitting needles that make or break how much you love working on the project, which then leads to if the project ever gets done. I'm sure we've all put aside projects and we don't know why, we just don't feel like doing it. A lot of the times it's because of the materials and the tools that we're using. It's also important to have a sharper tip when you are working on lace weight, but I find that if the yarn is more of a uh, yarn that's splitty, if I have an extra sharp tip, that makes the yarn split even worse. So it's a fine line. If you have a dull point, like I have um, my Addy Turbo, Addy Click Turbo, I think that's what they're called. It's got a really blunt edge. That is not good for lace. But I find that this tip is pretty good. Just think about the tools you're using. Slipperier fiber like silk, bamboo, um, nylon, anything with polyamide in it. You want to get something that's a little bit grippier or you, you'll be fighting with your stitches falling off the needle. Like if I had this project on my Hiya Hiya Sharps, it would probably fall right off. But things to think about when you are starting a project and collecting all the materials that you're going to be using for it. So my second, let's see, so we've talked about the two projects. One other tip with working with this. I found that in this amount of knitting, my yarn has broken, I'd say, four times working with it. And it's usually when something kind of got caught on it. Um, and I, I'm, I know you, you know, the spit splicing thing. I don't know. I just don't feel like spitting into my hand when I'm working on it. So I got this old bottle. This was some eye glass cleaner solution that was gone. So I filled it up with water and it's just a fine mist. So if I have a broken piece, I lay my two pieces on my hand, I spray it, and then I rub it together, and that just works really well. So if you don't wanna be spitting, <laughs> get yourself a little water bottle spray. And just keep it by you as you're working with the Pluto Lopi. So as, as we're approaching warmer weather and summer, I know a lot of you, um, with the busyness of summer or the fact that it's warmer out, a lot of people put their knitting down. And, um, I, I tend to knit all the way through. I knit all year. Summer is really my time to knit a lot of socks, and I love to knit things that I want to wear in the fall, so I'll have a few sweaters on the needles during the summer. We have air conditioning in the house, so I can still knit inside and not feel too hot. But I know some of you, um, I know a lot of podcasters do not do anything over the summer either. So there tends to be fewer things to watch. And I just wanted to throw out a few podcasts that I really enjoy. And a couple of these are pretty much the reason why I, I went into podcast or why I decided to make my own channel. They inspired me to do that. And I wanted to get to know them better. So um I thought I would throw out to you a, a few ideas if you wanted to do a little binge listening over the summer. This idea came to me because I had a, a knitting friend of mine who works in the school that my kids go to. Um, she knits beautifully, beautiful socks, um, and she just is really into the fiber arts as well. She asked me, well, what are some other podcasts you would recommend? And so in thinking about her and kind of how more, I think she's a, a more of an intellectual knitter, likes to listen to podcasts where there's, you leave the podcast where you feel like you've learned something, maybe not as much, um, you know, showing of product um, and uh, more just tutorial knitting knowledge, learning about different fibers and sheeps. So the first person I want to make sure you know about, in case you don't, but if you're here, you probably do, is Sarah from, from Fiber Trek. Sarah lives in Maine with her husband, who is a ranger. They live in northern Maine, 
kind of off the grid, I almost think, but Sarah um, takes you along to some amazing journeys that revolve around sheep and um, oh, takes you to different islands off the coast of Maine, like Nash Island, to do a sheep shearing. You learn so much about fiber. She coined the terms, I believe, place-based yarns and soulful stash, which I love to use both of those terms so much. And I highly recommend if you want to learn more about sheep in general and fiber, how to use the fiber and how to create beautiful projects from the fiber, check out Sarah from Fiber Trek. Another person that I've been watching since I started watching podcasts is Emily from Fiber Town, and that's fiber with an R-E at the end. She is um, a prolific knitter and spinner and now sewing her own woven project bags. So she weaves fabric and then creates project bags from them. But she really also focuses on... Um, the different fibers, the quality of the fibers, spinning them up, creating beautiful projects. One of the first projects that I saw she did was um, from a Jacob fleece of many different colors. I think she did, I think it was a Stephen West uh, shawl pattern that she did from all the natural colors that came off of a Jacob sheep. And that totally inspired me to want to visit local farms and as well as Sarah from Fiber Trek, but that inspired me to visit local farms and start using local sheep to my area and how that can be so gratifying as a knitter. So check her out, Emily of Fiber Town, Fiber with an R-E. Another person that I learn so much from every episode is Patricia from Knitography. I'm sure you've all heard of her too. She is an American that has lived in Norway with her family for, I believe, over 20 years. She is uh, she lives on a farm, and I believe she will be beginning to uh, raise sheep on her farm. But we learn so much about Norway, the area that she lives, and of course the Selbu Mitten. Um, story that she shares on her podcast. That inspired me to pick up the Selbuvater book. It's all in Norwegian, but it has amazing charts in it that I can knit from to create really anything. I bought it for the charts, but I'm following along with Patricia. She's sharing with us Norwegian words that we need to know as knitters that can be found in knitting patterns. We go on location with her to her cottage on the lake, uh, we go to downtown, downtown Trondheim. We go to the Salvu Vader Museum. So it's just a really lovely, lovely podcast where I'm always learning something new. Another newer podcast to me I've been, I recently started watching and really enjoying is Melissa from Knitting the Stash. She is, um, I believe she lives in central Illinois maybe Southern Illinois, but I think she's actually a professor. You go along with her to amazing farms, watch shearings. She's got really interesting projects. She's also, I believe, a weaver. She does have a loom, and uh, her husband is renovating a um, police, uh, a jail prison bus. <laughs> so you can watch his renovations and how that's going too. Um, but I really enjoy um, Melissa's pod, uh, podcast called Knitting the Stash, and she also has a great blog as well that goes along with it. Um, another one, if you have not listened to, another one where I learn so much is Maria from Ninja Chickens podcast. She lives on a farm outside of Asheville, North Carolina, and they are really homesteaders. They, I mean, you see, she, a lot of times she's podcasting in her yard and there's chickens and cats all in the background. And she, I believe I read she was a nurse and um, really focused on herbs. And at the end of each podcast, she tries to share with us a um, an herbal... Um, type of tea, uh, which I think is interesting to learn about. She is a knitter and spinner and dyer for Fern Fibers. Her and a friend of hers are natural dyers, so I really love learning about what 
plant materials she's using to get different colors in her yarns. So, and recently she found out that 10 minutes away from her house, there is a farm where they have camel and the owner of the farm didn't really do anything with his camel fiber. And so he's giving his camel fiber to her and she's going to be doing some, I'm sure, really cool things with that. So those are just some ideas for podcasts where you really learn a lot. You may hear about some new products um, out there, which I find interesting too, but the majority of their podcast is about sharing their love of the fiber arts, what they're working on, and teaching us about something. So I really appreciate that. All right, so let's talk a little bit about sheep today, like we usually do. I, as you know, I am fascinated with all the varieties, all the different breeds of sheep that this world has. And I'm especially fascinated with the type of fiber that, how the fibers differ so much from sheep breed to sheep breed, and the why. Why do they differ? Is it through um, specific breeding? Is it a nature thing where the sheep over time have just created a fiber that works for them in the climate. Um, that kind of stuff fascinates me. So in the last six months I kind of began the journey to understand sheep a little bit better and the different breeds of them by visiting local farms and seeing them up close and personal and using some of their fibers so I can really feel how they knit up differently and especially getting a lot of information out of the fleece and fiber source book. I know if you've watched the podcast you know that is a book that I use quite a bit. I also scour the internet to do kind of the research. But what I'm learning is that while a lot of it, um, a lot of the information, there's a lot of well-researched facts and data on this book that I use, the Fleece and Fiber Source book, certainly was well-researched and fabulous. There's also some very gray areas. And uh, a podcast viewer named Lynn so nicely emailed me. She is an Alaskan that now lives in Norway and is preparing to have a farm where she is going to be raising some Norwegian-type uh, breed sheep. And she... Um, saw that I was using the the phrase spell or the breed spell saw interchangeably with old Norwegian and she was under the impression that those were two different sheep so she did a little bit of research and we went back and forth and she pulled a Norwegian book and did some translating for me and what we have determined together is that the old Norwegian sheep is also interchangeably called Vilsa, which is V-I-L-L-S-A-U. And I did a little Google Translate and found out that Sa, S-A-U is sheep, and Vil, V-I-L-L, -L, means wild. So those were the old wild sheep, Vilsa, that we now call, we can call Old Norwegian. Now the spell saw is, um, a different breed of sheep and this there's two different types of spell saw there's the old spell saw which um, gamel norsk spell saw which means old or ancient sheep and there's a new breed of spell saw which is um, it stems from the start of the modern breeding of this particular breed in the 1960s so I just wanted to clarify that a little bit um, and just read to you a few things more. So the Gamel Norsk spell saw, or the old Norwegian spell saw, or old typical spell, and spell means fur in Norwegian, is a Norwegian race or breed that stems from an ancient spell saw in Norway before the start of modern breeding in the 1960s. Today, the breed is also a little affected by Icelandic sheep, Finnish land race, and modern breeding methods. Sheep size is between modern spell saw and old Norwegian sheep and wool quality and amount were important characteristics in breeding efforts around 1960. So that is when the change happened. And there's many color variations in both horned and polled animals. So you've got the old spell saw, the new spell saw, and then you've got the old Norwegian sheep, which is also the Vilsaw. So the old Norwegian sheep, or Vilsaw, 
are the remains of an original Norwegian European land race. And I, so I looked up what land race means and land, it's spelled L-A-N-D-R-A-C-E. And landrace is a local cultivar or animal breed that has been improved by traditional agriculture methods. So that's when you hear me saying that phrase that, or that word, that's what it means. And she writes in parentheses, I think they mean here that it is an ancient breed having characteristics typical of ancient breeds. And FYI, this is what I call Vilsa. And that's Lynn speaking and translating for me. Thank you, thank you, Lynn. This race almost, di almost died out a few decades ago, but active preservation work has meant now more, more now exist. It is a small sheep and horned with short pigment holding fine fibered underwool with coarse animal hair and a little coarser a little longer coarse fibered top wool. So she writes, it has three kinds of fiber, fine, extremely coarse, and then longer middling coarse fiber. Um, it's also said that the meat has a wild taste or tastes a little bit like venison. This breed is very hardy. And she says a word that is like economic, meaning they waste little can live on little and they have a strong flock instinct and mothering characteristics. So that's what we talked about last time, but I wanted to be clear that it looks as though Spelsa is different than old Norwegian sheep. Now, I found it really interesting. Lynn mentioned that she is going to be looking at um, breeding gray Tronder sow, which, and if I'm massacring the pronunciation, I'm sorry, but that is Gra, G-R-A, is gray in Norwegian. So um, she's gonna be getting those this fall. And the Tronder um, has to do with Trondheim, I believe in the area where these sheep were. And if you watch Patricia on the latest episode of Natography, she actually goes to a um, gray Trunder sow farm and um, you can see what those sheep look like. But that's a Norwegian breed that is in between a crossbred type and a landrace type. The, um, next, she said, the site says that the breed, that breed, is a cross between an old Norwegian and a Tautersaw, which is extinct. But actually, all of the sources I have read say that this sheep originated near Trondheim, thus the name Trunder on an island off the coast. There were monks living on the island and they imported merino sheep from Spain and crossed them with the Tauter or Tautrasau, which is now extinct. The, wood, the wool is way more like merino than like the old Norwegian. Gray Trunder sheep have different nuances of gray wool and a characteristic white spot under their eyes. The tail is half long. The wool is most like crossbred wool, but more fine fibered than wool of the Norwegian white sheep. So just a little bit more about Norwegian sheep there, and I've probably inserted some pictures of what we were talking about, but just wanted to say thank you to Lynn for helping, just having the dialogue with me and helping me understand a little bit about Norwegian, traditional Norwegian sheep. And um, I look forward to getting my hands on some of this and knitting with it in the future. On the next podcast, I think we'll be talking a bit about Shetland sheep. Since Paisley had her triplets on Wing and a Prayer Farm, that has led me down the path of learning more about the Shetland sheep in detail. I've heard a lot in other podcasts. Um, you know, obviously the island of Shetland is a very popular one amongst us knitters. So um, I'm looking forward to researching that a bit and sharing with you a little bit more, more about Shetland sheep next time. So that's it for me today. I hope you really enjoyed this podcast. I hope you learned a little something. If you have any questions for me, feel free to ask them in the question thread on the Ravelry podcast page, or you can ask a question down below. Again, if you want to join in on the 1000 plus subscriber giveaway, go to the thread in the Ravelry podcast page for that. And um, I just really appreciate all the thumbs up down below, any comments you have on our podcast. And I really look forward to seeing you next time on the next episode of Treehouse Knits. Bye.